can he still tell his story? And does his story confirm his memory? Did the Nazis perchance succeed in making the event untellable, unnarratable? Indeed, the book starts with a strong claim about the Nazis seeking to destroy memory to render the future witness impossible. But within pages, the book turns to the problems that obstruct a simple reconstruction of memory. Calling memory a suspect source, especially the memory of suffering, Levy notes first that the memory of suffering has a way of crystallizing as a story. This crystallized story then takes on a life of its own. And further, the memory, in being told and crystallized in this way, begins to restructure memory itself. Indeed, the telling of the story performs a crystallization of that memory of suffering that transforms memory in such a way that some of that original memory is lost. The story thus takes on a life that comes at the expense of the memory itself. Paradoxically, painfully, the story can actually become the means by which the original suffering becomes lost to memory. Here is his language, I quote. A memory invoked too often and expressed in the form of a story tends to become fixed in stereotype in a form tested by experience, crystallized, perfected, adorned, installing itself in the place of the raw memory and growing at its expense, end quote. The idea that the more such a story is told, the more it crystallizes, the more we lose the memory of suffering that prompts the story is, of course, a frightening notion. And though Levy resists the consequences of this insight, he's truthful enough to articulate it anyway. We might consider that what Levy fears, and also what he knows to be partially true, is that there can be a loss of the loss itself, and that this can be the very result of the story we tell, the very result of the story we tell that is meant to preserve the memory of loss. Of course, the story is told to make sure that the Nazi project does not achieve the goal of destroying evidence, and it's told precisely against the revisionists who have questioned the very facts of the extermination camps. The story is there to establish evidence, to acknowledge that there was an enormous, if not unfathomable, loss of life, and to provide the explicit recognition of that loss that mourning requires. But if the story makes more remote the memory of suffering and the memory of loss, then the story might be said to institute a kind of melancholia in which the suffering and loss are denied. This becomes all the more true when the suffering is already difficult to remember. Levy points out that, and I quote, many survivors of wars or other complex and traumatic experiences tend unconsciously to filter their memory. They dwell on moments of respite. The most painful episodes lose their contours, end quote. The trauma works to undo the painful memory as a bounded event. And the story in crystallizing the memory offers relief from precisely this traumatic encounter. Although I can only suggest this here, it seems worth considering that this story works in tandem with a certain forgetfulness, a forgetfulness that is actually needed for survival. The story that seeks to establish evidence of suffering on the basis of memory crystallizes that suffering, inducing a forgetfulness that helps the teller live. It would seem that the requirements of survival sometimes work against the requirements to provide evidence. The story does not return to the original memory, but helps to vanquish it. And though Levy believes that the original memory, preserved, will lend veracity to his telling, his telling is also in the service of his surviving, and so must act upon that memory, alleviate its traumatic effect, and even take its place. Levy's narrative finds resonance in other survivors' stories. You might know Charlotte Delbeau, uh, who wrote in After Auschwitz, and I, uh, I quote to you, uh, um, when I talk to you about Auschwitz, it is not from deep memory, sense memory, but from memoire externe, external memory, memory linked with thinking, end quote. This last is a memory that does not relive the event precisely in order to tell it. If she were reliving it, she would not be able to tell it. The reliving would destroy the possibility of narration. Indeed, in her own work, that narrative capacity occasionally does break down as sense memory interrupts what she calls external memory. At one point, she relates a story about standing in the roll call early in the morning at Auschwitz in the freezing weather. And she claims that as she stood there, she thought to herself, one day I will tell the story of standing at roll call in the freezing weather at Auschwitz. 
Um, in the next sentence, however, she writes, this is actually not true at all. I was thinking nothing. I could not think at all. And that is why it is not reasonable to think that anyone who underwent this experience would be able to give an account of it. They are not. Okay, those are her words, end quote. This does not mean, though, that therefore no account should be given. On the contrary, precisely because one cannot give an account, one must give an account. The capacity for narration suspended or debilitated by the trauma is precisely what emerges as the sign and evidence of a capacity to live on and survive. And Del Beau, when she reflects upon the veracity of her own account, concludes that she has no idea whether or not it is true, but she does know that it is truthful. So given the complex relations among memory, story, and trauma at work here, it makes sense to ground an evidentiary refutation of revisionists on something other than the claim of memory to veracity. Of course, the archives of survivor stories are based on memory, but let us be clear that the story can only aspire to truthfulness and perhaps not always to truth. <coughs> Testimony acts in ways that memories cannot, and memories depend on stories to be transmitted and to endure. I want to pause precisely here to suggest that we might take Levy's insight into the capacity of the story to alter and restructure memory, to crystallize it, and even to take its place, um, even to arrange for the evacuation of memory in the name of life, um, and ask how it functions within the field of politics. For it would appear that stories are not the only discursive means by which memories are acted upon and displaced. Indeed, it may be that when we, when we talk about trauma, we are talking about that which is not quite on the order of a memory, although it constitutes a past, it is a past that does not stop happening. The trauma continues, but not seamlessly. It must repeat. And even if it is invoked deliberately, that does not mean it is any less compelled. It, if it is invoked and orchestrated, indeed, it must be to some degree invoked and orchestrated in order to repeat. Or, in its repetition, it gives rise to an invocation. The discursive means by which the Shoah is reinvoked is precisely a way of calling upon the pain of its repetition and mobilizing that repetition and pain for another means. The question is whether it's, it is sometimes mobilized for political purposes with the consequence of displacing the pain and losing the reference itself. Now, in August of last year, for instance, we heard from Israeli settlers in Gaza who were being asked to evacuate um, that they, uh, that they were uh, uh, being asked uh, uh, to uh, get on uh, buses or cars uh, and to leave their homes, and that this request, this obligatory request, was, and I quote, a train <coughs> taking the Jewish people to their collective death, and that there is still time to stop that train. Okay. So the, uh, their understanding of themselves as being asked to leave Gaza, their homes in Gaza, was uh, not like a train, but is a train, taking the Jewish people to their collective death, and there is still time to stop that train. So it's an exhortation to the rest of us to come in and save them from that particular transport. We're being rhetorically situated by the train, outside the train, uh, which is on its way to a concentration camp, and asked whether we will go along with this murder uh, of, apparently, the entirety of the Jewish people. Uh, we're being asked to understand the evacuation of Gaza as the same as the train to Auschwitz, such as those who order or implement the evacuation are effectively Nazis, and those who are evacuated are interns of the SS. So this kind of, I can't even call it an analogy, because it is an ontological identification. Right? It's a, it, the, the, it, the copula is functioning here. It's not, it's not a simile, it is a, it is. A, it is. Uh, this, 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 I, this kind of equation happens, certainly, uh, time and again in Israeli politics, uh, and in politics that has Israel as, at its center within the diaspora. Uh, 